Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Beneath the Surface with Marine Mammal Care Center, uh, brought to you by Marathon. Um, they've helped us to make all of these possible for everyone. Um, and today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you all to uh, Frank Cipriano, who's going to talk to us a little bit today about um, some forensic techniques with DNA um, and how they're supporting uh, conservation members, uh, conservation members, <laughs> conservation of wildlife. Um, let me introduce you to, to Frank here. Um, Dr. Cipriano is an evolutionary biologist and ecologist. Um, serving with the International Whaling Commission's Scientific Committee since 1997. In the 1990s, he developed and used portable DNA testing methods to identify commercial products containing endangered and threatened whale and dolphin species. Such field molecular bi biology approaches have since been valuable for identifying um, uh, beach cast whale car carcasses and discerning dolphin population diversity using field collection biopsy samples from remote locations in Argentina. Uh, Frank has been a field and laboratory course instructor, Earthwatch project leader, National Science Foundation, marine biotechnology postdoc at the University of Hawaii, and conservation genetics postdoc at Harvard University. For 18 years, he has uh, been the director of genomics, uh, Transcriptomics Analysis Core um, and a Molecular Techniques Instructor at San Francisco State University. He currently serves as the River Otter Ecology Project's Scientific Advisory Board, um, is a research associate and an academic fellow at the California Academy of Sciences, a research associate, associate with uh, Fundacion Cithis in Argentina, and a member of the IUCN Cetacean Specialist Group. I've had the distinct pleasure of getting to know uh, Frank over the last couple of years um, with our participation in a group we call uh, Inter uh, ICPC, or Integrated Conservation uh, for Cetacean Conservation. Um, and it's been a, a really great pleasure to get to know Frank, and I'm excited to hear all about um, the information contained in this lecture. Frank, I'm going to send it off to you. Take it away. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for the introduction and the kind words. Um, and welcome, everybody, to this uh, talk. Um, I'm going to share to you um, some of my older work. And to make it sort of more interesting to me as I was preparing uh, this, I actually, uh, the, the earlier version of this a couple of weeks ago was a talk I put together for a friend and his rotary group. And so um, I went back through old slides and uh, presentations and tried to sort of bring them up to date and put them in the context of sort of current uh, uh, affairs in, in the science world, um, having to do with the use of forensics for wildlife uh, testing. So I'm going to tell you a bit about that and about how um, my description, my title has changed over the years, even though I was doing the same thing, um, what people were doing around the world changed as they, as they called it something else. And so that's um, sort of the background behind uh, some of the information I'll, I'll give to you today. So um, let me find all the controls. There we go, there's the button. So uh, wildlife forensics is, is a relatively new field. Um, and it was created because uh, the endangered species trade is very valuable and anything that's very valuable um, is uh, likely to expand and increase. And so uh, estimates, and of course, be, being that it is an illegal wildlife trade, um, it's hard to estimate the true value. So um, various attempts have been made to do this. Here's an excerpt off of the traffic a website where they estimated between seven to 23 billion. So about 15 billion, I think is what I put in the abstract. And um, what, how, wherever it is within that range, it's a lot of money. And to put that into context, the value of the illegal drug trade, which is also, of course, very difficult to estimate, was about between 426 and 652 billion back in 2014. So even more um, valuable than wildlife products, but um, kind of in the same ballpark, billions of dollars per year. And um, one of the the organizations I need to introdu introduce you to is CITES, the Convention on International Trade. 
of uh, species of wild fauna and flora. It's a, it's a gigantic organization, um, an international agreement between governments or, or an IGO, an intergovernmental organization. Um, and that entered into force in 1975. And almost, it's not exactly an I, uh, a UN uh, treaty. Some treaties are under UN auspices, but almost all UN members are parties to the convention. And in fact, when they have their, their biennial meetings, um, they call them COPs, COPs, the Con uh, Conference of Parties. And uh, the international wildlife trade includes a lot of different things, um, not only live animals um, and plants, but also the parts and products of products derived from them. And so CITES under various uh, different uh, or, uh, um, categories um, has uh, protection provided to more than 37,000 species, um, whether they're traded live or as parts and products. And this is a big deal because wildlife trafficking has been shown to be extremely important in driving species close to extinction or to ex extinction. And um, this estimate from, a, from an online uh, news site suggested that wildlife populations may decline by as much as 62% in areas where trees uh, species are traded. So that's just like the, the dollar value, that's a big deal in terms of, of conservation value. Along with climate change then, wildlife trafficking is one of the big contributors to biodiversity loss. And um, that's been described in a series of, of different uh, research articles. And at the end of this talk, I'll have a slide that shows you the, the full um, citation for some of the things that I'm presenting sort of on the fly here. So you can, you can see what those are. So back to my involvement with, with this field, um, we use DNA studies, D DNA analysis for a lot of different things. We can identify species to, uh, specimens to their species, to their sex, to the stock or the population. Um, and that's a, that's a whole uh, body of, uh, of, uh, of work, uh, a field that's called conservation genetics. And um, you can use those, those uh, genetic estimates to determine various things. You can, you can trace maternity and paternity. You can sort of test the, uh, the robustness of your ability to describe individuals as belonging to one stock or population. And you can also trace the evolutionary history or phylogeny of those organisms. And that's where my interest in this tool came from, because I'm a uh, molecular biologist interested in using it as a tool to trace evolutionary history um, of my favorite species and their closest relatives, which are some of the dolphins. And um, these genetic estimates allow you to also calculate various other genetic parameters, such as the relatedness between individuals, the genetic diversity of populations, and the interchange rate or the connectivity between populations. And these are all sort of descriptions of how much genetic interchange goes back and forth. And the, so the genetic the revolution, the molecular revolution that started with the invention of PCR uh, has provided a lot of new tools for understanding wildlife diversity, and that made them available for other uses as well. The specimen sources that we use for this um, are quite a different variable because the DNA from any part of a, of a uh, biological source is the same, whether you're, you're uh, using it from the muscle, from the um, blood, um, the skin, any part of an, of an animal has the same DNA sequences inside it. So it doesn't really matter what, what you use. And we found that certain pro, uh, parts are very easy to extract DNA from. Skin is good, muscle tissue is very good. And so the biopsy um, samples that are shown in the bottom middle of the slide, I'm sort of circling them with my cursor. Um, those biopsy samples were derived from free swimming dolphins um, and um, they contain the thin outer layer of skin um, that is actually a rich source of DNA. And we just, we use a, a, a a pole, a trekking pole with this device. It's just a, a cylindrical wood rasp on the end of a plastic rod uh, in order to collect a tiny little snippet. You can see at the bottom in these tubes, those tubes are just about an inch and a half long. So you can see it's a little strip of skin, um, the black skin from these, these, these uh, Cumberson's dolphins, that's what these samples are from. Um, and that's a source of abundant DNA for our, for our analysis. But you can also get it from uh, bone tissue and here's a colleague in Argentina 
um, preparing to isolate some DNA from the bone, from a skull bone of a Cummerson's dolphin. And you can also get it from commercially available products like this doggy, this uh, supermarket sample N1 in the lower right, um, which is a bit of whale blubber and skin at the top with meat below and conveniently packaged with a little bit of wasabi. So this, this field, DNA forensics, um, came about because people using those tools that I, I just described that are useful for describing the population distinctiveness of, an, of animal uh, specimens or tracing uh, paternity or maternity, those same tools, those same DNA analysis uh, tools that use sequence analysis and some other kinds of, of DNA analysis, um, along with uh, conservation genetics and the need for, for documenting the trade in endangered species, endangered wildlife species, um, resulted in this new field called DNA forensics. And um, again, this is a case where those of us doing this sort of thing uh, we're doing it first, and then the term was re was invented later, along with conservation genetics. We were we were a biologists, molecular biologists, doing population genetics, and when we started doing that on endangered species, it started being called conservation genetics. So back to the story of doing it um, with endangered whales. Um, the reason that we got involved in in doing this kind of analysis of of uh, commercial market products from whale species um, was because of the commercial whaling mor moratorium. Um, you probably all know that, that uh, whaling caused a dr dramatic, drastic decline in almost all whale stocks, um, which are, and stocks is a, is a, a, a sort of uh, jargon term that we use um, to describe really populations of whales. So it's taking a species and subdividing it into all of the, all of the uh, fin whales in the North Atlantic is a population of fin whales. Um, and those are described by the, uh, by the regulatory uh, body, the IWC, as a stock of whales. So that's where that term came from. And it actually is borrowed directly from fisheries uh, because uh, most of the early whales, whale biologists working on these kind of problems started out as fish biologists working on similar problems, but with fish species. And so um, because whales were driven, most whale species were driven almost to extinction, um, the, the organization that controls whaling, the International Whaling Commission or IWC, declared a moratorium in 1982, which went into effect in 1986. And um, Back in 1982, that moratorium was agreed by the members of the IWC that it would continue while the scientists that work with the IWC, um, mainly within the scientific committee of the IWC, um, would uh, extend the moratorium until a way to do whaling safely to not drive species to extinction could be devised, including both a management scheme and a way to set quotas. So, what is the International Whaling Commission? It is not, as this uh, truck sign would have you think, the International Window Corporation. It is the International Whaling Corporation. And it started um, with a treaty. It's, one, it's the second oldest fisheries uh, treaty in the world uh, from 1946. The only one order, older is uh, having to do with um, stocks of Atlantic cod. And um, signed by uh, 17 different a member nation, so this is again an intergovernmental organization, an agreement between government between official governments, um, and you can see that all this all of the signatories uh, were white males, older white males of the day, and seventeen members member states signed it. Um, that grew, and it, and when I first uh, prepared this talk uh, back quite a few years ago, there were forty. That seventeen had grown to forty four. That number is now 88 member states of the IWC. So a lot of different um, uh, countries are members of the, of the International Whaling Commission, even though they may not do whaling, even though they may not even have a coastline. And the IWC is, is recognized by many UN treaties, such as the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, the UN, UNSAID Agenda 21, and CITES, which, as I mentioned, is not really a UN, tre uh, UN treaty, but, it, but it's most of its members are UN members, um, it's been given the, the mandate to be the primary organization that controls the management and conservation of, of cetaceans because it's older and it's been doing it for longer. 
somewhat successfully, you might, you might say, um, especially since we recognize that the moratorium was a pretty drastic step that was needed because all of the earlier attempts, and there had been several, to um, control whaling had just uh, been totally ineffective because pirate whaling went on. And even though there were regulations and, and quotas and, and uh, no, no uh, allowed take of certain species, it went on. And it, it went on to an amazing extent, which I, I don't have time to go into today, but uh, we're talking about hundreds of thousands, not, not just a few dozens of whales taken illegally. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of whales taken illegally after some of these regulations went in. So the IWC was an attempt to do that better. And um, part of uh, its remit was to regulate whaling by regulating the whaling industry through the action of its member governments. The IWC cannot order particular um, whaling industries in a country to do something, but their, their home government can. And so the IWC act, acting as an IGO can influence its member governments to come up with regulations, it's their own legislation that controls whaling within their own territories or of their nationals working in international waters. And here you can see um, in this diagram how some of these different things are divided up. Um, UNSAID Agenda 21 um, has to deal with marine conservation, but IWC has precedence when it comes to conservation of whales. CITES has to do with trade control of endangered species products, um, including of whaling, but um, how those, what's uh, considered endangered and what should be controlled is left to the IWC, despite attempts by um, certain whaling countries to take that control away. And um, the law of the sea controls shipping and, the, and what the borders are between exclusive economic zones. Um, so you can see the sort of world of, of uh, management of marine products um, is divided up under several players and the IWC is central in this. So commercial whaling, as I said, drove almost all the large whale sphinx to the brink of extinction. And here you can see a plot of just the catches in the Northern North Pacific. Um, these are the legal catches, not including the um, recently discovered illegal catches. And you can see that all of these great whale stocks um, rose, increased rapidly to, to a peak at some point, and then died off, literally died off as that species was driven to commercial extinction, if not biological extinction. So the whaling moratorium um, was sort of the incentive for us to develop these forensic techniques for whales because um, we needed to investigate the wildlife trade because of, of whale products because even though there was a moratorium, whaling did not stop. Um, there were certain kinds of whaling that did not stop. So here's the, um, an earlier version uh, of this summary table that I made in 2004, showing which whaling countries there were and what they were taking and how many. And you'll notice right away at the top of the list that the United States is a whaling country. It was then and it is now. And that is because um, US citizens, including Alaska Eskimos or Inuit peoples, take bowhead whales. And at this point in 2004, they were allowed to, take, to, to strike, that is throw a harpoon at 67 whales per year. Um, gray whales, also taken by native uh, peoples in the Arctic on both sides of, of, the, of the North Pacific, um, the US uh, natives and Chukotka natives had a total take, permitted take of 140. And you notice the difference between struck and, struck and, and, uh, struck and taken um, because bowhead whales um, are often when they're hit with the harpoon, they get away. And so for the permitting process, the quotas were assumed that if the whale was struck, it was killed, whether the, whether the hunters were able to retrieve the carcass or not. So that's why it's given in terms of strikes rather than takes. Uh, the gray whales, if, when they're hit usually from a, a larger vessel um, with an with a, uh, exploding harpoon, um, those are pretty much always uh, pulled back into the boat. And so those are given as takes. So that gives you sort of an idea what's in this table. Now, if we go down the list, you see uh, Canada is a whaling country. Again, native peoples taking bowheads um, in the Arctic, but a small number. Uh, Canada has been an IWC member. It's not now, but it is a, an observer. And so they do send uh, representatives to IWC meetings. Um, Iceland has taken various species of whale, 
um, including uh, back at this era uh, where they had a scientific hunt uh, where they were taking some Miki whales um, in relatively small numbers. Um, they have since, um, hence, since actually um, increased their hunt by taking other species. And I have more about that later. And you see that other, spe other countries have taken uh, various numbers. So whaling did not stop in 2004. Um, and in some cases, um, as with Japan and with Norway, reasonably large numbers of whales were taken, although nothing compared to the numbers that we see in here, where we're talking about tens of thousands of whales uh, being taken per year. And so these are hundreds per year. So because there are whales taken um, in various places around the globe, especially the, the larger uh, aspect whaling countries like Japan and Norway, um, there is a market for whale products. And you can go to Japan and buy various products in the supermarket um, because they are sold legally there. And so this, gives, this slide shows you sort of a variety of supermarket samples from packaged uh, sort of dried beef jerky whale bacon um, to fresher, fresher things. Um, this is that same one with a, with a nice dose of, of uh, wasabi with it uh, to dried whale blubber from a sperm whale. Uh, this one also is probably sperm whale and to steaks um, and fillets of lovely whale meat on, on sale legally in Japan and also in Norway and other countries. So our DNA analysis techniques allows us to get a sample like one of those and analyze the DNA, sequence the DNA out of it. And in, here in the lower left, you'll see a, a, a little fragment of DNA sequence from a bunch of different whale species lined up and you can see the differences between them. So these top three, uh, we have a, a bowhead whale, a right whale, a stay whale, a brutus whale, um, gray whale, fin whale, just by these codes, I can, I can tell what those are. So a variety of different whale species. And you'll see that um, within a species, these are pretty invariant, but between species, there's relatively distinct and clear differences between them in their DNA sequence. And when you reconstruct the phylogeny or the, re the genetic relationships between those whales as shown in the right diagram, you can see that you can sort things out to species quite handily at high confidence levels. These numbers are the confidence levels associated with these, with these identifications. Um, sometimes they're a little bit low, but that's, when, that's because we can't really tell uh, which of these species are, is most closely related to the other. But within a species, all of these are, are above 90, um, which is a fairly high bootstrap value for, for these uh, the quality of these identifications. So you can, tell, you can tell whale species apart by taking a small bit of tissue, um, analyzing, extracting the DNA from that. You hear, see, see me here working in somebody's kitchen in Japan um, and uh, determine what species it came from. And we've done this uh, many times over the years in various hotel rooms um, around the world uh, in Japan, uh, South Korea, um, Denmark, a few, a few other places, Greenland, um, and Iceland. And um, this, cast, this cast of characters are various people who have gone on, on these surveys. In the lower left is Scott Baker. He did the, very, the first ever uh, species identification survey in Japan. And uh, the next one over is me to the right. Scott and I did the next a survey in 1993 in, in Korea. Um, and this, this is uh, my bed covered in newspaper and then huge slabs of whale meat. Um, at that point, whale meat was quite cheap in Korea. It is no longer cheap in Korea. It's quite prized. And then with this, with this relatively small amount of equipment you can that fit into a relatively small suitcase, um, you can do the initial stages of the analysis on site and uh, extract the DNA, amplify the DNA, run it in a gel um, so that you can see whether you were successful at your amplification. Uh, image that gel in a, um, on an ultraviolet bench in order to see the bands of artificial DNA that, that are glowing in this picture. Um, and then analyze the DNA, sequence the DNA in that gel slice or in the, in the PCR product that you've created using a couple of, of tricks, and I'll talk about those. So um, we started doing this project because we wanted to know just what was showing up in uh, the Japanese market and, and the Korean market especially, 
um, being some of the larger whaling nations um, after the moratorium, because they switch. They're, they switch from a large take of uh, whales before the moratorium went into effect to a smaller take, but still in, the in terms of hundreds of whales per year that are now called research whales. Um, and research whaling is a uh, practice that is allowed under the ICRW, uh, ICRW Article 8 um, was put in there that allowed taking whales for research purposes. It was added to the convention um, when, they were, when they were drafting the convention at the insistence of, drum roll please, the Americans. The Americans thought it would be a good idea to do this, and that turned around and bit us in the butt eventually. So research whaling under, the, under Article 8 um, does not require permission from anybody. The country can set its own quota and take as many research whales as it wants. And so that set the stage for um, whaling continuing after the moratorium and Japan being able to continue taking hundreds of whales per year um, completely legally without breaking any rules. Norway, I should mention, um, also continued whaling after the moratorium went into effect, but under a different loophole or a different um, process. That is, when the moratorium was voted on, Norway objected. And as with many intergovernmental inter organizations, um, the rules are set by consensus. And so oftentimes, if you object to a proposed rule at the time it is first proposed and you vote against it, you don't have to follow it. And so Norway does its whaling under objection. Even though there's a moratorium effect and Norway is a member of the IWC because they objected to um, the moratorium, um, they do not have to follow that rule. Japan did not object. Um, they probably wish they had, but they did not object. And so they had to re resort to this other loophole, which is research whaling under Article 8. So here we come fast forward to the current situation, or at least 2022, the last year I had good numbers um, for what was being taken. And in this updated chart, I put in red where things have changed or changed drastically. And so for some of these takes, um, you see there's really no change um, in, in what's allowed. But in others, um, there's been quite a few changes. And you see that at this time, uh, Iceland had gone from taking a few minke whales um, uh, in, in the tens back in 2004. Then they went to um, taking more hundreds per year. And actually, just a few years ago, the Mickey whale industry in Iceland collapsed. It was no longer commercially viable. Um, but fin whales are now being taken by the richest man in Iceland, who bought up some old uh, Norwegian, or actually Japanese whaling uh, vessels, uh, catcher boats. Um, he bought a bunch of them. He refurbished three of them. And he takes about 400 fin, fin whales every other year or every third year, and he ships them directly to Japan. Um, Greenland has increased its take of uh, the species that, as it takes, and this actually is sort of a good news story. Um, Greenland is now allowed under the IWC quotas for Aboriginal subsistence whaling, which is not commercial whaling, to take bowhead whales and humpback whales because the bowhead whales and the humpback whales in the Arctic have increased in numbers and are actually almost back to or back to their pre-exploitation uh, population numbers. So that's, a, you know, that's sort of a good, good news story that there's enough of them that they permit the native peoples in these areas to take a few, not very many per year, but a few um, to preserve their cultural heritage. The story with Japan is quite <laughs> a checkered. Um, Japan actually left the IWC in 2019. Before that, they were taking hundreds of whales, mainly in the Antarctic, mainly Antarctic Miki whales, uh, four or 500 per year. Um, after they left the IWC in 2019, they switched. They no longer send a very expensive uh, commercial uh, um, uh, mothership plus a, a host of catcher boats to the, and are the way, all the way to the Antarctic where they have to hassle with Greenpeace um, and, and uh, those, those sorts of organizations. Instead, they stick closer to home and they see, uh, whale only North Pacific whales. And you can see that they're actually relatively small numbers, although still totaling up to a few hundred of each of these species uh, per year. Um, and at the bottom, you can see that uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which has one whaler, but although he has an apprentice now who's learning the trade 
Um, they're permitted 28 takes per year. This is humpback whales. And usually they take one or two humpbacks oftentimes, although it's not allowed under IWC um, regulations, oftentimes a mother with a calf so they can get two for the price of one. And um, that happens every other year or so. So whaling continues under the moratorium, but with some changes over what's taken and how many and where in the world that happens. So back to this um, technique of doing what we, what we originally started calling portable PCR, doing PCR in the field um, by taking along with you a um, relatively small list of materials and consumables um, in order to do the initial stages of the DNA analysis. And this is uh, from my trip to Iceland. This is the, the packing list I used on, on my way to Iceland in, in 2012. Um, that includes all of the equipment and materials I need to analyze samples there. Um, a little bit about the technique to give you uh, some information on one of the tricks that we use to be able to do this part legally um, is that um, some of this, the, the, the technique is done in the field, in that hotel room or somebody's, somebody's kitchen in Japan or Korea or Iceland. Um, some of it is done in the field, but we bring back the PCR product. And the PCR product is the amplified DNA. It's an artificial artificial copy of just a small fragment of the DNA, that fragment that I sequenced that I showed you a, a little segment of, of sequence from. And um, we are allowed to bring that back if we purify it or attempt, at least attempt to purify it. And CITES uh, permit is not required, even though these are all endangered species under, under our um, appendix one, most of them, um, or appendix two of the CITES um, regulations. Um, and so, uh, our CITES authority here in the US, which is the US Fish and Wildlife Service said, you know what, artificial DNA is okay. You can, you can move PCR products around um, without breaking any rules. And so we use that trick. So those gel cuts that I mentioned, or those, those, uh, the, the gel that, that I said we ran, we cut out the glowing uh, band. Uh, it, it, the, the artificial DNA glows under UV light if you stain it with lithium bromide and you can see where it is in the gel, you can see what size it is so you know you've amplified the proper fragment of DNA. You can cut out that glowing band, bring it back and then sequence um, the DNA, that artificial DNA that's, that's in that little gel cut. So that's the trick. And here's a letter that I usually travel with, uh, printed out and laminated in my carry, carry on luggage um, that um, shows that, that Marshall Jones uh, head of the wildlife, Fish and Wildlife Service said, PCR product is okay. So here is a picture. This is Greenland um, of what it takes to do this work um, in a hotel room. I've got two PCR machines, these tiny little PCR machines. I've got a power supply um, and a gel box all in one unified thing. I've got a, a ultraviolet transilluminator, the smallest one you can get. Um, I've got lots of pipettes. Um, a voltage converter and pipette tips and other and plastic tubes and of course the chemicals that are needed in order to do this PCR amplification. So a relatively small suitcase can go with you and do this wherever you're going. And these whale meat surveys, as I said, we did them in, in a variety of different countries and you can do various uh, sort of analyze various aspects of this. You can document which species are available. And that was the first question we had because uh, Japan, in its research whaling, wrote itself permits to take minke whales, both southern minke whales and North Pacific minke whales, which are actually different species, um, same genus, different species. Um, and our, the question was, when Scott did that very first survey uh, back in the, in the early 90s, um, in the market, is that what you're getting? Are you getting only minke whales? Are you getting other species? Um, in Iceland, where minke whales were being taken and being sold as convenient, uh, prepare, you know, frozen, uh, th throw it in the microwave and, and have a, a hot dinner ready in mo minutes. Um, the question was, is, every, is it all minke whales? Because that's what they, their permit um, issued by their government authority had given to the whalers that they could take at that time. In other places, um, we might actually go to a restaurant and see what, what uh, was being sold and marketed as a particular whale. Um, fin whale is, is considered th the best uh, whale meat in Japan, and so a lot of whale is sold as fin whale, and the question was, is it really fin whale? And there's a whole variety of different products um, you can buy in Japan, including dried, canned, packaged, um, 
items, you'll notice that these are, are all sort of fancily packaged. Whale meat in Japan is not what you eat on a weeknight. It's what you take the boss out for for a fancy dinner. Um, it's expensive. And um, even, even the canned stuff is, is expensive. Um, and in Korea, although on our first trip it was cheap, um, in later surveys, we were buying smaller and smaller packages of whale meat for larger and larger price tags. And actually the cost of doing one of these surveys is, is quite significant, not, not just getting a biologist and all their equipment into the country to do this analysis, but also to buy the products, um, which can be quite pricey. So here's a, a selection of a, a collection of, of the products that collected in Japan in the early years um, that we still have archived there in, in Sunwood's freezer um, in case we need to go back. And we have actually gone back to those samples to reanalyze them when something interesting came up. And here is a summary of what we found in those surveys um, between 1993 and 1996. And these are various surveys done by uh, various organizations Usually it's either me or Scott or me and Scott in, in all of these, although um, a traffic group actually did one of these uh, in, the, in the mid nineties. Um, I forget which one, which one of those there is. And so the question is, which species are, do we find? And here, here on the left, you see that the, the list of all of the great whale species, also some dolphins some uh, toothed whales, and starting here with sperm whales and, and on down, and some things that are not dolphins at all, like artio, gen, generic artiodactyls, which are even-toed hoofed mammals and sheep and horse. So as, in terms of which species we were, we were finding in Japanese markets, it's easier to tell you which ones we did not find. It's a shorter list than the ones we did find, even though their commercial take of the research whales was only these two at the top. You see that those are the most, that they're the largest numbers of all, but that's certainly not all that we were finding. So did, did we prove that they'd done something wrong? Well, not exactly. Um, the, the response would always be, well, it was in the freezer. And in the case of humpback whales, which we got a few times um, over this period, it would have had to have been in the freezer for 26 years for it still to be found even in this first survey in 1993. But we had no way of proving it hadn't been in a freezer for 26 or more years. And the same is true of fin whales. Although uh, at some point in here, uh, Iceland started exporting fin whale to, I think it was actually after 1999, started exporting fin whale meat back to Japan. And so there would have been essentially legal whale, fin, uh, legal fin whale meat on the market then. Another aspect of what you can study with uh, this, these whale meat, uh, whale products, Mark commercial whale products is what's in them, uh, what contaminants are in them. And so in 1999, we did our first sort of coordinated analysis of what con contaminants were in the products that we purchased sorted by species. And here I have divided up the species. Um, there, each, each one of these is, is a sep sep separate species, but I sort of lumped them into toothed whales or adonocetes. Those are the dolphins and porpoises, beaked whales, all of the, the teeth bearing uh, uh, members of the cetacea, and then the mysticetes. And we did the two uh, largest uh, categories here are Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. Um, so this includes the Northern Hemisphere minke whales, which was the most abundant in our samples, and the Southern Hemisphere minke whales, the Antarctic minke whales. Um, and then on <clears throat> this axis, you can see the different contaminants, sort of, sort of um, uh, the, the simple version, because most of these contaminants have various forms, different forms, all uh, many different types of PCBs um, that we have lumped together into total PCBs, or, or all the different types of DDTs that we've lumped together into total DDTs. Mercury actually has, has both a, a less active form and a, and a more active form, a more toxic form. Those are summed together here for total mercury. And so you can see that, especially for the adonocetes, um, there's a problem at this, this end for both, PC, for, for both organic pollutants, PCBs, but especially mercury for all of the adonocetes in, in the sample. Um, the mysticetes, not so bad, but um, certain, uh, at certain components, the PCBs and DDTs, these fat-soluble organic uh, contaminants, are found in high numbers in these large fatty animals that uh, feed not high at the top of the food chain uh, for, for the uh, baleen whales, 
the, the toothed whales are feeding at the top of the food chain, and that's why they're concentrating some of these other, these other components. So a problem uh, for the human consumers of whale meat in Japan. Another problem is, uh, as I sort of alluded to in the beginning, is these, uh, con these controlled but still legal markets for commercial, com commercial whaling under the guise of research whaling can drive certain species or stocks, populations of whales, to extinction. And so this is a paper that we wrote looking at the decline, uh, projected decline in numbers of a particular type of, of uh, North Pacific Miki whale, the J-stock, a population found from the Sea of Japan. That's why it's called J-stock. And um, that's, that population is characterized in this pie chart as having a lot of red, a lot of yellow, and a little bit of blue and orange. Those are the different haplotypes, mitochondria haplotypes are sort of different variants of the gene. Um, you can tell that it's a, a Miki whale by the sequence, and you can tell um, by which particulars of the sequence what population it's from, or give a, give a sort of confidence limit on which population it's from. So that's the JSTOC from the Sea of Japan. And we had these, uh, these uh, samples available from the period of commercial whaling when they were archived and analyzed. And so we knew sort of, uh, we were able to ground truth what the JSTOC looked like genetically. And the O-stock um, is the offshore stock. Um, and that is characterized by this blue pie chart, which is mainly blue with a little bit of red and a little bit of orange. Um, and in the market, um, this is what we got, this middle one. We had a lot of blue. Um, so that looks like big component is being taken from their uh, research whaling in the North Pacific. But some of these other colors are more like what you're finding in the Sea of Japan. So this was suggesting to us that a lot of JSTOC whales were getting into um, Japan's whale product markets um, and probably through what is called bike catch or incidental catch, where whales are entangled in fishing gear um, and um, if they die, um, and, and after a certain period, Japan uh, allowed the fishermen to kill the whale and incidentally tangled in their fishing gear and put it into the market to sell it commercially. And so our question was, well, if, if, if uh, this many, if it looks like JSTOC whales are getting into the market, how many, how many in excess of what's being taken by the commercial take out here in the, in the open ocean, um, how many are likely getting into the market and what does that tell us? And what does that tell us in terms of our projected uh, population numbers for JSTOC um, if this kind of incidental take goes on over time? And so this chart on the right is three different scenarios. And on the left in red, you see the decline in JSTOC abundance um, over the period of commercial whaling. Um, you can see where the moratorium kicked in and that, that a drastic shift in, in a bending of the curve, everybody knows what bending the curve is now, a bending of the curve um, to a much lower number, but a de decline then continues. And it doesn't matter whether we assume there's 50 incidental take whales per year, 100 or 150, um, even at only 50 per year, which our, which our market analysis said was the minimum that's being uh, in, entering into the market, even at 50 per year, um, JSTOC is declining and it's on the way out. It's heading towards extinction. So not the extinction of a whole species, but the extinction of a sort of distinct stock of whales. And how distinct is JSTOC? Well, they breed six months apart from O-stock. So that is an indication that they're really quite different, that they're breeding um, with only themselves um, in probably in a different area. We don't know where, where JSTOC uh, whales uh, breed and rear their calves. Um, we don't know that for any minky, inky, any minky whales around the world. We have no idea where the breeding grounds are for any species of minky whales, any stock of minky whales anywhere in the world. Um, JSTOC is probably over here in the, in the Yellow Sea uh, to the west of Korea, but we have no information on that. They're so rare um, that they're just never seen except when one of them blunders into a, a, a fishing net. And around Korea, the source of the, of the whale products in Korea is also in um, but from bycatch, and it's uh, we, we we call it sort of directed bycatch because these whales blunder into um, fish traps that are made out of um, a uh, a material much like hurricane fencing, so steel hurricane fencing set in a um, tapering cone with a big net at the end, so put right into the migratory path of the whales, and so by mistake those 
animals are caught incidentally in those uh, fish traps that are put right where they migrate. And then the products are sold in Korea as well. Well, that's a quick romp through some of the issues. You can see um, where we went, where we, where we started, where we ended up is being able to say that, um, uh, be, being able to say actually quite a lot about what's going on with, with uh, whale products entering into, the, into commercial markets and being circulated and traded around the world in some cases. Um, and uh, one of the stories I, I didn't talk about, although I have time to squeeze it in now, is we actually did go back to one of those samples taken in Japan in the early years because its mitochondrial sequence matched something in GenBank. GenBank is the repository of, of uh, DNA sequence data that we all use. Now it's got genomic data in it um, of um, the, uh, the huge quantities of DNA that we're now sequencing from lots and lots of different species. But we found from this particular product um, that it matched what was in GenBank. And it was, a, it was an interesting product because when they did the, the analysis, it was taken actually um, in Iceland uh, in 1986. Um, and uh, they found out it was a hybrid. It was a hybrid between a fin and a blue whale. So if you sequence the, the mitochondrial DNA, it looked like a fin whale. But if you sequence the nuclear DNA, it had one allele from its mother and then one allele from its father. And they were different species, and one were blue whale and one a fin whale. So, um, we can, we can do a lot with this kind of analysis. And in that case, we were actually able to track an individual whale because not only did we have the mitochondrial DNA, I went back to Japan, I sequenced another, a nuclear gene from that animal and, um, and compared it to the um, archived sample from uh, number 26, that hybrid whale that was taken in Iceland. We were also able to trace the uh, export of that particular product or, or of fin whale products in Iceland in that year to Japan. So we know a lot of fin whale went to Japan. So it's not surprising that we were able to sort of trace the life of one particular whale um, from its conception, the, the mating between a, a fin whale and a blue whale to its consumption in Japan um, many decades later. So thanks for your attention. Um, I'd be glad to, to take questions or comments. Um, we have lots of time as planned so that you can um, let us know what you think about this. Any suggestions, comments, or questions, I'm happy to hear. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. That's uh, truly fascinating. And um, <clears throat> while, uh, while everybody's gathering their thoughts, I had a, a few questions that I would, I would love to pose to you. Um, uh, sort of earlier in your, your lecture, you showed the, the graph of, of sort of the ramp up of, of whaling, commercial whaling. Um, really taking off in and around the late 40s through the 50s. Um, I think when we learn about whaling in schools, it's usually, you know, the Nantucket sleigh ride and, and um, you know, old, uh, you know, whaling is this thing that happened in the 1800s or something like that. Um, what, what's going on that it ramps up so, so dramatically in the 50s? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Dave, because it's just, it's sort of shocking uh, to think about it now. Uh, the, the era of commercial whaling, of factory ship whaling, which is what you're talking about, those, those, those decades, um, was not for meat. It was only for the blubber. It was only for the, the oil that they could extract out of the blubber. So huge whaling fleets from the U.S. as well as most of the other industrials, uh, industrialized countries of the Northern Hemisphere, they were roaming the oceans and they were basically strip mining the sea of all the large whales. And they started with the biggest ones, the blue whales and fin whales. And as those got depleted, um, they took smaller and smaller species, um, leaving um, minke whales, which are one of the smallest and most abundant of the original stocks as the, the, the remaining few, um, which is why Japan was sort of concentrating on minke whales. There were enough of them in the Antarctic to support um, whaling um, in recent decades. So that era of commercial whaling, which was um, just hundreds of thousands of, of animals, millions over the years, um, is, what, is what did the trick. And it was not for food, um, although uh, in some cases, uh, whaling has been used to supplement protein sources. Um, in Japan, after World War II, the occupying country encouraged development of the commercial whaling industry in Japan 
in order to feed the population, to have another source of protein for the population. So that, again, was the Americans. Um, fascinating. Um, also, you, you showed a lot of images of you doing um, analysis of, of, of all of those meat products uh, in hotel rooms. Um, why weren't you in a lab? <laughs> Well, we, we started out doing it very undercover and, um, and we did not buy the products. We actually had people, Japanese people in Japan, Korean people in Korea, buy the products and accumulate them. And then one of us or a couple of us um, would show up and process them in a, in a quick, in three or four days, go through, extract the DNA, um, uh, amplify it, isolate the gel cuts and bring them back and then sequence them when, once we got home. Um, so it was all undercover. Um, it's not illegal, but we didn't want to let anyone know what we were doing um, because we could be, could be, be harassed um, for, for doing something, even though it was legal. And um, we also did not want to uh, penalize the, the vendors. Um, we did not want to, to, to cause them any problem. It wasn't really their fault. Um, after the 1999 survey, when we started discovering how polluted um, those products were, there was a lot of interest, especially in Japan, and actually initially by the fishermen, the whalers themselves, especially the ones who were doing small scale uh, dolphin and porpoise fishing, because the worst of those products were the, was the offal, the livers, the, the internal organs that were not sold commercially, they were mainly eaten by the people who mm. caught them. And um, we hired because we couldn't, we didn't have a trick like this, like the CITES control for the PCR products for getting the products, the, the complete product out of the country um, would have required a CITES permit. So we had to instead pay for in, in country analysis of the pollutants. So we partnered with two Japanese researchers. Um, we didn't tell them what we were doing. We just asked them if, if they would be able to analyze um, some samples for us. We did about 100 samples in that 99 survey. It was very expensive um, in order to do that because actually, because the solvents that you use um, have to be ultra pure um, mm -hmm. in order to make sure that you're not contaminating the samples as you're trying to analyze them. So we hired a, a, uh, an expert in the, in the organic pollutants and another expert in the, uh, the metal pollutants, uh, mercury, and had them do that analysis. And of course, they knew when they when they opened the package and saw what we were sending them, we were mailing uh, to them from around the country as we did our survey. Um, they saw what it was, um, and they got interested. And they got very interested when the results started to come back in, and they started buying products themselves and analyzing them. And actually, both of those two professors, Dr. Endo in in, um, in uh, uh, the Northern Island of uh, Hokkaido, and Dr. Haraguchi down in Fukuoka, um, they started basically changing their research focus because the numbers were just so bad. And there was a liver sample in that first sample set that had 600 times the amount of mercury in it than was allowed under Japanese regulations for human consumption. And they didn't believe it. So they, they sent it out, they analyzed it again. Uh, uh, Endosan sent it out to a colleague and had the colleague analyze it. And then they went to stores and they started buying products themselves. And they sort of have continued um, so, some, some of our products, but a lot of, a lot of their own work. And actually, um, they, they, they've, they've even come to the US and, and uh, I trained uh, uh, one, one of Dr. Haraguchi's new colleagues um, on genomic analysis in, in my laboratory. Um, so we have, we've, con we've continued to have ties with them. And so we did have labs to work in. And, and some of my last surveys in Japan, I would, I would actually go to, uh, Dr. Haraguchi's lab in Fukuoka and do, do my work there. And in fact, the whole, my whole kit is still there. And, and his colleague, uh, Yukiko, I sort of bequeathed her my, all of my DNA kit because she used it to um, diagnose through the initial stages of the analysis of the, of the samples that she, she then brought to the US that we could do the genomics on. That was actually not whales at all, it was mice. Um, but uh, <laughs> another, another story there. So um, we were doing it, the, the short answer, we were doing it in order to, to be as secretive um, and as under the radar as possible um, so that we couldn't be harassed and also said, so that the providers, the, the vendors wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be under the thumb uh, for, for providing us with those things. None of it was donated. We bought 
all of those things. So we had people, undercover investigators, go in and buy those things. Um, in some in some cases, that was actually me in Iceland and, and Greenland. I could go into the supermarket and buy whale meat. I was there was a lot of other uh, haoles doing the same thing, so it, it, I didn't stick out so so much. But in Japan, that would have been too obvious, so we didn't do it there. Uh, we had a question from the the chat. Um, but where you find the highest concentrations of, of chemical pollutants, um, you've, you've mentioned it's within the different uh, organs, uh, organ meats, um, but are there different species that are more toxic than, than others? Yes, yes, indeed. And uh, well, it, it varies a bit by what species, what group, phylogenetic group of species. So the adonocetes, the toothed whales, which feed high in the food chain, um, I can, I can tell you the statistics uh, for tooth whale products in Japan uh, from memory, because 100% of those products had too much mercury. Mm. And it didn't matter which tissue you're talking about. Um, liver was the worst, but um, even, even the red meat was, was very bad. And as I said, there is a lot of interest in Japan when we started making those numbers known by the fishermen themselves. Um, they were calling. They were calling up Endo and Haraguchi and, and you know, asking, what, what can I do? Am, am I in trouble? Um, the Japanese government's um, response was to say, oh, just pour boiling water over it and everything will be fine. <laughs> Which is not true. I'll, I'll give you a hint. It's not true. <laughs> that doesn't yeah. fix the problem. <laughs> I, I'm imagining that it would not. Um, so uh, we had another question. Um, I'm not sure if you would know um, any insight into the gray whale die-off in the Alaska Baja population uh, in the last few years. Yes, there's there's been a couple of die-offs, and again, kind of like the the um, uh, increase in in species being allowed to be taken by native peoples in the Arctic. That's sort of a good news story. Gray whales are at carrying capacity. It looks very much like they are back to their um, pre-exploitation numbers. And in a bad year when there's not quite enough food, when the climate conditions cause a decrease in the number of amphipods growing on the bottom in the, in the uh, Bering Sea and Chukchi Sea, um, there's not enough food. And so they get skinny and they starve or they die of disease because they're out of condition. So it's not, it's not a happy story, but at least it means that um, they are back to where they, they once were. So that's a big success to have restored um, gray whales on our side of the Pacific. On the other side of the Pacific, um, there are very, very few uh, Western gray whales left, and, the, and it's, a, it's a viable scientific question being discussed at the IWC Scientific Committee. Are there any true Western gray whales left? There was a population that went, swam up and down as, the, as our, our Eastern gray whales do on this side of the Pacific. There was a population there that swam up and down um, probably bred in the same area as those, those elusive Miki whales in the, from the J-stock, somewhere to the east of Korea, um, or sorry, to the, yeah, to the, no, to the west of Korea, west of the Korean peninsula. Um, they are seen rarely, a few every year, and usually it's when one blunders into a fishing net in Japan and is killed. Mm -hmm. So um, they've come back on our side of the ocean. They have not, gray whales have not come back on the western side of the North Pacific. Oh, thank you. We, we had another question, um, and you had alluded to um, the fact that you could work in a lab now in Japan and that there was interest from uh, Japanese fishers about the, the contaminants within um, the whale meat products. Um, to do this type of research in Japan uh, today, do you, do you still have to be a secretive? Um, yes, and, and we, haven't, we actually haven't done surveys lately. Um, Although with the change to the change in, in where they're doing their whaling operations now, um, we should, and we and Scott and I have actually talked about it, is, is we probably should do some surveys just to see um, and, and to maybe to monitor the decline in the presence of Southern Hemisphere Minky whale meat on the market, which should be, it should be, you know, they should be depleting the magic freezers um, at, at about this point. Um, and uh, we should only see North Pacific species. They've increased the number of species they're taken. It's now not just Mickey whales, but Brutus whales, which is the second biggest and most abundant uh, smaller baleen whale in that area. Um, um, 
so it would be a it's a it would be an interesting question to see like what's in the market now that that, that things have changed. Oh, and, and actually, um, back to the that pollutant question, sperm whales, which Japan did a little bit of, a few takes of sperm whales when they were expanding their um, their research whaling program in the North Pacific. Um, they were so toxic that basically they 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 had to be treated as toxic waste. Uh, so sperm whales are just full of of everything bad, both both organic pollutants and 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 mercury. And it's it's interesting as as top level predators in the oceans, um, they seem to be doing okay, even so. And uh, the, there's lots of studies going on on the physiology of sperm whales to see how do they deal with these high pollutant loads. Um, they can handle it. We couldn't if we ate their mm. ate their meat. So so that that may be saving them uh, from future exploitation. Uh, just curiosity, you, you had mentioned that fin whale was sort of the the premium uh, whale meat out there. When it's marketed in Japan and Korea, is it marketed by species or is it just marketed as as whale? Uh, it it depends. And actually, that was one of the other research questions we had was how much misadvertising goes on. Um, is a lot of cheaper whale meat or, or uh, different species, less prized whale meat, being sold as fin whale in Japan? Yes, it is. Is a lot of adonisite meat, that highly polluted, 600 times the allowed limit of mercury kind of product, is that being sold as whale meat in Japan? Yes, it is. And in fact, uh, when those pollutant values and the misadvertising story um, started to come out after our 1999 survey, and we published a, a, a slew of papers, and then Endo and Haraguchi have continued to do that. Um, there was a lot of consternation in Japan, and certain um, grocery chains stopped stopped selling whale meat um, for a few years. They're back. They're back to it now, but that definitely made them sit up and, and pay attention. And so we need to we need to come up with a new hook, another thing to get this back on the radar. Um, but um, one thing I should I should mention though is that. The whale market in Japan is dying out naturally. The younger people are not that interested in eating it. And so um, it's still a luxury food. It's sort of a, 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 um, a novelty food um, in Japan, but it's not being, being eaten regularly by most people, mainly older people and um, under certain situations like taking the boss out for a fancy dinner, those kinds of things. Um, so the question is, is the whaling industry going to die out in Japan before JSTOC does. Hmm. Um, we have another question about the toxicity. Have toxicity studies had an impact on the dolphin take of, I don't know how to pronounce this, Iki, Iki, Iki Island? Island. Um, initially, yes. Initially, yes. And um, there was that initial reaction. Um, the Iki Island hunt is the is the dry fishery, much like the the grind in the Faroes, um, where they um, just like once a year they go out and they herd a bunch of small uh, cetaceans, uh, toothed whales into a bay and then they slaughter them um, and and produces those um, incredible pictures. The movie The Cove, which I have a copy of but I've never been able to force myself to watch it, um, is about Iki, uh, that 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 dry fishery. Um, Yes, they should be concerned. Some places like the pharaohs, um, there are regulations that pregnant women and women of childbearing age should not eat the products from those, those small cetaceans. So it's clear that, that uh, the, the, health, the health effects are clear. Um, it is a traditional uh, cultural aspect of those societies. And so they're trying to hang on to it. Um, it is of course commercially valuable as well. Um, but whether that will uh, c continue in the future as the health effects become more, um, more known, uh, we just don't know. Um, it's, it, it's going on at a very low level in, in, uh, in the pharaohs still, um, and probably the younger people are much less likely to, to, to be involved in it. Well, uh, thank you, Frank. Um, everything that you've shared with us today is, are, is so fascinating. Um, the techniques that you were able to do, the, uh, the history lesson that we've gotten today as well has is, is been uh, really fantastic. So I want to thank you for um, providing us with that. 
Uh, also to let everybody know that we have our next two scheduled um, lectures coming up, not in, for a, a little while. We have um, uh, Andy Johnson, who's gonna talk about uh, sea otters on uh, 428, um, and Jessica Fuji on 55 is also gonna talk to us about sea otters. So we have a little sea otter mini series coming up um, at the end of next month. Um, and then sometime in the interim period, we're going to find another date for Mark Jackson from NOAA Weather Service to talk to us about uh, weather, climate, and uh, cetaceans and mammals off the coast of California. So uh, look, look to the, your, your emails and Instagram and whatnot to see when we might reschedule Mark Jackson to, to join us on his lecture. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Frank, and thanks to everyone for joining us tonight, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.